Well, good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Um, my name is Mike Ryan. I, uh, I work with Eagle Direct. Um, we are really talking about a hot topic today. It's about, uh, about cooling cows and, and what we do and what we look for when, uh, when cows are hot and just some of the physiology um, behind what's actually happening uh, to that animal and just the, the natural ways that she cools herself down. And then obviously some interventions that we can do as the weather heats up and some of the protocols that we can get around to actually cool, cool cows. I'm really, really excited about the panel that we've got here today. We've got Doc Wolf, who's joining us um, out of Wisconsin uh, this morning. Welcome, Doc. Uh, I first met Doc in 2017, and I couldn't get over the amount of information uh, that Doc had rolling around in his head. Um, uh, Doc, uh, Doc as a, is a vet, uh, but in his own veterinary practice, and really started uh, following um, his customers' uh, success stories and, uh, and how, uh, how by ventilating cows and, and building animal-centred um, environments around these animals, uh, how successful and, uh, his customers were. So it's great to have Doc here today. And, uh, and I guess the, the things that Doc and his team at VS with Peter Farangoober and Henry Collins have taught me over the last four years um, I thank them for it and, uh, and it's great information. They care about the cow and they care about the producer. So really exciting uh, to have them on board. We've also got uh, Charlie Chase joining us from the South Island in New Zealand. Uh, we work with Charlie on cooling cows and we've got a couple of projects that are happening uh, in his part of the world, which is really exciting. Um, but Charlie comes um, from, uh, from managing uh, dry lot dairies in uh, California, but has been in New Zealand for nearly 10 years or over 10 years, Charlie, and has got a strong uh, consultancy business and does a lot of work with AI, uh, breeding programs, and also nutritional work with his customers. So it's really great to have him that's on the ground on different farms every day as well. And he'll join the Brains Trust afterwards. And, uh, and Colin Thompson, when I first started networking in Australia, I was told that go and talk to Colin Thompson. If Colin Thompson is doing it, uh, then it's right. And Colin Thompson didn't answer my phone for two and a half years, but guess what? He answered my phone and eventually we've been working with Colin for the last, I guess, two and a half years. And it's great to run and just seeing some of the, I guess, the, some of the concepts that we think will work and seeing them practically working and the benefits. So Colin's going to join us uh, for the Q&A and just talk about some of his success stories as well. So really excited about today. Please. Uh, keep your questions and fire them through on the question and answer. And we just really want to open it up after Doc's presentation just to answer your questions and go through some of those conversations about cooling cows and, and what that looks like as we reach the summer months. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Doc. I'm going to drop off the video here now. And uh, if you've got any Q&As, shoot them through. Doc, they're all yours. Thanks, Mike. Um, I hope today as we go through this uh, presentation that the, the take home message, I want you to have a, a little bit more core understanding of how heat stress affects the cows and all some of the, the major uh, systems of the cows physiology. So, um, so with that, uh, we're going to kind of go through that at first and then a little bit on how to target a little bit more into uh, the systems that you folks are, are working in and how some of that can be mitigated. So first I'm gonna start with the respiratory system. And this is something that's been huge for me uh, looking at from the day that calf is uh, born, hits the ground, that we wanna conserve that respiratory system on this animal to the day it leaves as a healthy cull and, uh, and leaves your dairy. So we wanna make sure we keep those uh, lungs healthy through its entire life cycle. And because we have a lot invested in these animals over this uh, five, six years that we hope to be part of your system, that we have to really make sure we're taking care of that uh, respiratory system. So if you look at the respiratory rate compared to a horse, a horse has got uh, a, um, a whole lot, um, as far as lung capacity is, uh, is great in terms of respiratory rate, a horse breathes a whole lot slower than what a cow does because uh, she has such great lung capacity where a cow um, needs a whole lot more uh, breaths per minute in order to keep up with that. So again, she's going to require more oxygen than a horse just standing in the pasture. So if you look at uh, lung capacity, the cow has got a smaller lung compared to the horse, and she also consumes more oxygen. So that's really huge that we conserve this, this um, um, 
part of her body that uh, is such a, it's like the uh, draft on the furnace that we have to uh, take care of that so that we can get uh, the oxygen in to burn the fuel that we're putting in. So we wanna make sure that we're uh, not losing that function. Again, if we can burn our fuel efficiency, the, the, the animal's gonna grow better, gonna gain faster. We'll come into productivity and reproduction sooner and will perform better because she has healthy lungs. If we damage those lungs and at times uh, abscesses and things like that form in those lungs, that's a re uh, reservoir of some nastiness that later on can be uh, released back into her system and cause her to become ill further down the road. So we wanna make sure that we keep them healthy. And it's a, a huge part of the cooling system. About 30% of the cooling on a cow comes from the respiratory tract, expelling the hot air and the humidity that comes out with her breath. So if we're looking at heat and heat abatement, you know, compared to uh, a cow versus us, the human is like one light bulb and the cow is like, you know, 16, 15 to 16 light bulbs. So it's about as much uh, heat on a per hour basis as your wife's hair dryer running at full at, at 1500 watts. So it's hugely important that uh, we figure out ways to get that heat off that animal. So this studies that have been done in the past here, and they're looking at milk per cow per day in terms of of uh, liters or kilos and how when we get this magic number here right around 68 on the THI chart uh, calculation that we start losing milk production as we go higher above that. So again, the more we can keep that cow, you know, below that level as much as we can and uh, keep her from spending as much time, reduce the amount of time that she's gonna spend in that higher THI environment is gonna be best for her. So we look at the, the THI again increasing on lactating cows, the, uh, the, uh, the milk hue goes down is what I just stated in the previous. So it's another correlation of that. So on lactating cows, I got this over here a bit, thank you. Um, so again, the, the dry matter intake of the cow goes down, that there's lots of things going on internally in that cow that's signaling her to, uh, to back off on eating. And, um, and so there's a lot of repercussions on that that we'll talk about here in a bit. So again, this is a, what they call the thermal neutral zone for the cow. So it's running here from about uh, you know, minus uh, uh, five up to about 25 is where she is the most efficient. Now, right here at this break point, which we're gonna run in here about 20 is where that starts to fade off here. And uh, so it's, that's where we wanna keep these cows as much in that zone as we can. Now in your uh, area of the country, you don't have to deal much with this end that's below that. Uh, here today, uh, I'm looking at about minus four Celsius where I am today. And uh, so that's right at the threshold where these cows would start burning more energy just to maintain themselves uh, versus when they're in this area here. And, and the cow would uh, would like to set her thermostat, you know, somewhere here in about this, this 10 to 15 uh, Celsius is where she'd like to live most of the time if she could. But that's obviously not always possible. So let's go into the reproductive system of the impacts that it has on that. So you're gonna have uh, increased embryonic loss and abortion rates, and we'll go into that a little further why. And again, this cow is gonna start moving more fat out of her fat reserves, and that will pull weight off as that uh, energy is being supplied as she uh, uh, can't supplement all her needs because she's stopped eating as much. She's got a huge requirement for glucose, and uh, so she has to start burning fat in order to make up for that. We got an increased twinning risk and uh, with your block calving, uh, I don't know how big of an issue that we see this in, in, in seasonal or uh, year round calving barns, where if they don't get the cows pregnant during the summertime, they're blocked in with the fall breedings. And those cows, when they start to um, cycle again after the heat time, they're not bringing up one primary follicle, they'll bring up two. And so we've got cows that are ovulating two uh, uh, fertile ova that can be uh, turned into the twins. And then what also happens when they freshen again is right into the, uh, the heat of next summer is where they're going to be calving their high risk animals anyway with this uh, extra animal that's within her uterus that, th that she's trying to feed. So that puts a huge stress on that cow. And that's why um, that time can be real uh, risky for that animal to even survive that, that progress or even have a successful uh, breeding after that. So getting those uh, calving, you know, feathered out. And I think that's something that, uh, that uh, Colin will be talking about later in his own experience with uh, the, uh, his system that he's gone to on a year round basis. So again, the, the cow flow, you know, to your facilities, you'll end up where the time of the year, 
when, because you didn't get cows pregnant during the heat of the summer or during that time, in your case, starting into the, the first part of the summer, if those cows aren't getting pregnant, they're going to be leaving because they didn't fit into your block. And so you're losing those by excess calls in a year round system. When it comes to the uh, time of the year in the spring where those calving should have been, they're not there. So the cash flow on the dairy is less. And again, that, that impact of having more animals freshening during the, uh, the heat of the summer, you know, puts pressure on your, uh, on your calving and transition facilities and that increased the risk for, you know, failures. Again, uh, the point here about timing, we just talked about that in terms of how it has an effect on your cash flow and cow flow. And then the, the cost per cow is, you know, around $10 a day for every additional day that that animal didn't get bred. And again, that's uh, looking at your system, especially with a block calving system. It's a little less than uh, what's considered for a, a year round system. But again, it's huge to you guys that they don't make that those breedings through that block uh, cal or breeding season, you're going to end up with animals that uh, are going to be called from the herd because they don't fit the, the, the program that you're under. So in this first few days after that um, embryo is, is, is you know, formed from fertilization, there's a glycoprotein, it's like an antifreeze that protects this embryo during this first stage. And so this is when there's a high likelihood of loss. And these losses that happen on these early stages, you're never going to know because they occur before your 21 day uh, re uh, insemination or re uh, reheat capture. And so anytime after this, that risk is still there, but a lot of them happen here in this early stage. And that's why it's hugely important that we're keeping those cows cool during those uh, times. Now, there are some folks that try embryo transplant that, that those embryos are a week or better older. And so they're past this uh, real uh, at risk time. And some folks are trying that to avoid that with some success. But Again, that doesn't fit into every dairy's uh, model of uh, how they're gonna manage their breeding system to avoid those early losses. So again, the embryo loss at different THIs goes up dramatically. The 3.7 times more likely to lose an embryo uh, with the higher THI. And, uh, and again, back to this twins, that if we end up twins because these animals brought up two follicles instead of one as they start their cycles again, uh, we're at a higher risk to lose those pregnancies also. So this is a year-round calving. It's actually one of my clients that uh, um, was just a naturally ventilated barn, uh, had some fans in there with some soaking and stuff, but it, it just wasn't nearly enough. So as we go through the seasons here in winter, and again, that's less of an issue, but you can see we, get, we lose conceptions here because those cows are um, mobilizing energy reserves to keep warm. And so that's, again, not a challenge so much for you, but for for us in more temperate climates, we'll see this during this period. And then we come to the, uh, the summer and uh, even in early March that these cows are already starting to lose on their conception rates. They bottom out here about in September. And then as fall uh, comes and into winter, they, they rise again. So this dairy is what I call the, uh, the, the conception rate roller coaster. And this goes on every year after that. And it has an impact also on how their, their heifers into the herd because they're kind of in, inducing uh, more um, pregnancies, you know, that, that form after the fall here to come into the summertime. And I'll show you a graph here later representing that. So, so here's this heat stress calving pattern, follows that same roller coaster again, you can see, and you can see here on the, uh, the, uh, the spikes here, these are the first calf heifers that are coming in here during this uh, midsummer because those are those calvings. Uh, that, that should have been back here in the springtime and they didn't happen because of heat stress. So again, this is your effect on, on your, uh, your milk flow out the dairy and your cash flow. And the more uh, we can even this out, that makes life a whole lot simpler for your operation by keeping those calving flows better. Again, block calvings, different uh, breed of cat here with challenges, but uh, where there are dairies there in the, in, in Collins as an example, and he'll talk about this later on how this, uh, changed on his dairy as he went to a better cooling strategies on his, on his dairy. So again, we got this gap here and you got the summer peak and it preats again over here. So, so let's look at the immune system. Now everybody, uh, we, we, we think about, uh, you know, the effects on cows going off feed. We think about the effects of uh, repro milk production, but one of the biggest drivers here of the effects on this cow is actually the gut and what happens to the immune system when these cows are under stressors. 
So if we go a list of stressors, and this isn't complete, but all the different ways that we put stress on these cattle, you got heat stress, handling stress, whether it's uh, loading them and trucking them somewhere, or just uh, people being, uh, uh, you know, low welfare standards on how they handle cattle uh, will stress them. If we have overcrowding under, under certain situations, that's going to put stress on the animals. If there's tissue trauma, where these animals tend to be injuring themselves because of the environment that they're in, or again, if someone's uh, mishandling these animals, again, those things add to the stressors. There's more cortisol being released into that animal system in response to that. We got both rumen and high gut acidosis. So again, we get rumen acidosis. This cow is, uh, is not eating feed. That rumen is going to tend to become acidotic because she's not chewing her cut and buffering it as well as she should. And so more uh, carbohydrates are getting dumped into the small gut. And when they get down lower in the gut, it uh, creates an acidotic situation there. And that causes a change in the, the natural bugs, if you want to call it that, in that gut. That, that are keeping that gut healthy. And when we get those environmental change, it has a, an effect on, on the tissues of the gut lining. And you got mycotoxins that can come from both from, you know, grasses that may be growing wild. I don't know how big a deal, uh, um, you know, molds or mycotoxins are in your grasses and your grazing systems, but also we'll see this in, uh, you know, forages that are ensiled and uh, can end up with uh, mycotoxins that actually form, they're in the, in the, say the grains in the field and when it came in as corn silage, they're in there. And again, they're a challenge to the immune system. And again, if we had dietary inconsistencies that cows are slug feeding because of the way we're timing how they're exposed to their feeds will make them slug feed. And then they have times when they're, they don't have feed in front. So it's hugely important that the diet is both consistent in how it's put together, but also in the availability. So these animals don't end up with these roller coaster uh, environments in the gut. So again, if we look at this leaky gut syndrome, it's called, where we're starting to get things weeping across into the bloodstream that shouldn't be there. 70% of, of a mammal's, you know, including ourselves, the immune system lines your gut. If you ever opened up an animal, there's lymph nodes that line that small intestine continually. <coughs> Excuse me. So what happens is a reduction in these tight junctions that holds this one cell layer. That's the difference between the inside of the gut where all the... Uh, the food is and all those chemicals are and the bloodstream on the outside of that. So it's a very fine um, uh, barrier between those two. And again, these compounds, when they come into the immune system and they and take a look at that, it just hypersensitizes and turns on this immune system to really pull glucose. And that's one of the things that in your cows <clears throat> is being produced by the liver and normally would go to the udder and turn to lactose. And that really drives milk production when we have that available for that purpose. So again, uh, when we activate that immune system, we got more blood flowing to the gut and that's taking it away from the udder and then the skin, which is part of our cooling system and other parts of the body. So that's why it's hugely important that we don't have this leaky gut syndrome going on. And again, we get the milk drop and that ability to dissipate heat. So if you wanna look at it, you know, the heat stress cow will met metabolize two grams two kilos of glucose each day. So that's two bags of the sugar that you can get at your local grocery store there. That's how much she's burning through in a day under that situation. So it's a huge driver is, uh, you know, the sugar being turned into glucose and it's being metabolized, you know, by the, uh, the cells of the immune system, huge driver. So as we go to the, the stressors and the leaky gut, again, the whole with the heat stress, this cow is blowing off because she's panting. She's blowing off CO2 here. So she's not uh, creating the saliva that she should. Um, we got reduced feed intake, which causes reduced in, um, rumination. So the less saliva, we end up with this low pH in the gut. So we got more carbohydrates and, and nastiness going into the lower gut. And um, so we're, we're going to pull body fat because if we can't make up with the glucose, we're going to start taking weight off this animal. And uh, even seeing uh, feet lesions down here, uh, with a digital pad because we're pulling weight off these cows and, and that's something that's a real issue in freestall setups. Uh, maybe also be seen in your, uh, in your pasture type settings also because we're pulling that excess or, or not excess, but we're pulling excess weight off that animal that can be used there for reserves for both uh, reproduction and uh, just general health and well-being. So again, this tight junction is, uh, is reduced. So if you look at the hierarchy metabolically, 
who gets the goodies first, if you want to put it that way, uh, in terms of priority, your brain needs glucose. That's what it operates on. And so does the cow. So that's first priority up here, but right below it is the immune systems. So these are the two top highest priority in terms of where that nutrient pool is going to go and how the body uh, uh, decides who gets it first. And then we have reproduction next. And that's something we very commonly see is under heat stress, you will lose your reproductive performance before you'll see the milk drop. So again, a huge indicator here that a lot of times I'll, you know, a person that says, well, I, I don't see much of a milk drop, but I ask him what he's repro doing and it'll show up there that even at mild heat stresses, you can be losing on your repro, even though it may not be showing up on your lactation. And then finally had the muscle and then anything excess, the body's gonna say, I'm gonna convert that into the fat and, and put it there to store for later. So again, the heat stressors, uh, um, on your transition cows, you know, we don't want to forget your dry cows that uh, we want to make sure we got the dry cow intake there for that transition period. It has an effect on colostrum quality and volume and uh, the birth weights are affected. And there's a, a great uh, paper out of uh, 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 Jeff Dahl out of the University of Florida that really goes in depth in this. I would encourage you at some time to, to take a look at this or maybe part of another presentation down the road that to understand these effects of, of dry cow cooling has a huge impact on not only the dam in her next lactation, but also the effects on that calf down the road as they become into it being a lactating cow, the, the effects that that has on them. So there's long-term effect of, uh, of uh, heat stress on dry cows. And again, you have the, the increased in metabolic and, and infectious diseases that happen on, uh, on stressed animals during the transition period. So if you look at how the cow gets rid of heat, we've got uh, convection. So that comes from the respiratory system. Again, I said about 30% comes out this way. And then from evaporation, now a cow sweats about as much as we do, but that's spread over an animal that's significantly larger. So it's a, not a really efficient way. So we provide artificial sweat by, by soaking these animals. And then hugely important that you have to put airflow over them to uh, evaporate that. So again, next we have radiation. So infrared heat and I'll show you some uh, uh, pictures that uh, uh, Dean had taken, Dean Fry had taken early here out in uh, with a, a floor camera looking at the heat coming off cows. But anyway, that uh, goes both ways here. So we have both heat coming in and heat going out. So if we got this cow out in the sun and she's trying to get rid of heat that way, but mother nature's pushing a bunch of radiation at her, there's a balancer. And then finally we have the, the conductive heat that when she lays down on the ground, She'll um, get the coolness from that, but once she starts heating that ground up, she'll want to stand back up and, and get airflow around her. So that's commonly one of the drivers of, of lying time. If we're not able to cool her effectively when she is lying down, uh, that she'll again stand up. And the more we have the cow standing, there's less blood flow going to her udder. And so there's a high correlation between lying time and increased uh, milk production. You know, it's, it's anywhere from you know, in that one and a half, two kilos of milk per hour that, that we get increased lying time. So how do the cows cool themselves? Well, we got the evaporation again through sweating and I mentioned how that's not the most efficient way to do it, but soaking uh, helps that dramatically to, to improve that. The respiratory system, and then when the cow starts breathing over 60 uh, breaths a minute, that's an indication she's going into heat stress. And if she gets up into that 70 to 80 range, 80 range and above, she's getting more into severe heat stress. And this is something you can do with your own animals of just watching your animals breathe with either a stopwatch or most you have on a phone that you can actually get an idea of how fast these cows are breathing without having any fancy probes or anything else to tell you where those cows in turn are doing in terms of heat stress. So again, they're gonna drink more water. So we have to make sure we got water available to those cows um, whether it's uh, after they come out of the parlor in particular to make sure there's plenty as well as out in the, the barns, uh, the amount that we want or out in your pastures, I'm sure you're well aware to make sure you got water close by so those animals can, can keep up that, their hydration. Again, what we generally look for in a, uh, in a uh, freestall barn is to provide at least nine centimeters per head of lineal um, tank space for those cows to have access if they, they all want to drink at once. Shade, hugely important here. It can cause bunching if there's not enough of it available. And you probably see that if you have trees out in your, 
in your pastures that they want to congregate around those. Um, that's a plus and a minus. You get them out of the, the direct sunlight, which is hugely important, but it also creates a, a condition where you can get some unsanitary conditions there because they're uh, defecating and urinating and wanting to lay in that same area. So that can put you at risk for more mastitis. And it also, if it's done enough, you'll actually kill the trees that they're, that they're lying on because of the compaction and the, you know, the, the extra fertilizer basically that they're dropping right in that tree. <clears throat> so again, the cows wanna see air movement. So having breezes, you know, and depends on the area, how consistent those breezes are and how intense they are, are hugely important. Uh, to that and in areas where we're going to have cows congregated like the parlor and, and the collecting yard holding pen, we have to make an artificial breeze there uh, when these animals are that packed together to drive that air down into that cow mass. So again, cows will want to stand, you know, to get cool and they'll also tend to want to stand if you've got a creek or stream or a, a pond uh, that they'll go out and stand in that, uh, in that pond um, to cool themselves. And you may wonder why would they want to do that when you think about it, and especially in our country where we get sub-zero temperatures, cows don't freeze their feet off. There's a huge amount of blood going to the feet of an animal, and that's another place that they can get some radiant heat from that amount of blood flow uh, that's going to the, the feet themselves. So again, another um, thing that these cows are telling us that, that they're trying to do to compensate for the heat that they're accumulating. So here's uh, the THI chart, here's the breaths per minute. Again, these are something you can go back and refer to, but these standards of, of just using breaths per minute to give you an idea of what's going on with these animals' rectal temps. And again, this chart, uh, you should all have something you know, printed or available and something you can read. But again, as the humidity goes up at any temperature level, the, the heat stress and that's, you know, goes up. So that's why it's curved. Now for, um, this is very applicable for the most part for um, you know barn environments but as we get to you know your pasture situation it's going to be similar to feedlots and they generally will consider airspeed over those animals as well as the uh, um, uh, solar radiation so that's something that we don't usually consider but it for pasture based uh, herd that's something that has to be in the equation is how much solar gain as well as uh, uh, how much wind speed and that's something that the, the current THI does not take into consideration wind speed, but we are finding through uh, research um, by multiple sources that, you know, creating airspeed that's above, uh, you know, at least one meter per section minimum, and we like it better in that closer to one and a half to two over these cows has a huge impact on cooling these animals. <clears throat> this is the equation for those of you that are, are interested in math, but uh, that's where it comes from. But again, there's no, uh, wind speed or uh, uh, solar gain, you know, included in that. So here's um, uh, from taking and, and wetting a, an animal, how many minutes does it take before they, they start rising again in temperature? So at these lower air speeds, it's still air and 0.1 meter per second. That's not enough to uh, have an effective uh, evaporation from, from that surface. So we, we've got to be more in this one meter to two meters per second will do well enough and um, and then you start to have the rise again. So again, the, the gap between soaking times shouldn't be more than seven minutes in most cases. Uh, the maximum that we're doing on, on freestall barns is, is, is every five minutes with, uh, with uh, five, five minutes gap between the pen with the one minute on is generally the way they're set up. But again, but you can see once that animal gets dried off that, uh, um, that surface temperature is gonna start going up. Here's a study done by uh, Kansas State and they looked at how the air flows over the animals. So we took these animals and, and, and drove the uh, you know, core temp up here from the again, like, forgive me for having uh, Imperial. There's a little bit that always sneaks through in my presentations. But, uh, but again, we're driving this up uh, maybe a, a degree and a half. And uh, here's where we should normally be down here at uh, 102.2, which is 39 Celsius. And so this is at least a couple degrees Celsius up. And this is how long it takes to cool those animals, you know, down with these different air speeds. And so um, the controls here, obviously, uh, that they, they remained hot, but at the higher air speeds, 
we can dry that down, but that takes 90 minutes and, and these cows are still are not down fully to their basal temperature. So that's uh, an indication that we need to uh, make sure we're sustaining this airflow, especially in more controlled barn environments. Again, back to pasture, um, we don't have that luxury because uh, we don't put fans out in pastures to cool the cows. We're relying on mother nature to do that, but we certainly want to take that opportunity to put airflow and soak those animals when they're in the, the parlor and holding pen that two to three times a day, depending on your, your milking schedule. So this is a, actually one of my clients that we had probes in. And the, the point I want to make here that these cows are being cooled by high pressure fog, but the, the lower group here, we had more airspeed on them. So they still heated up and you can really look here when I, when I triggered these things to start, I didn't have the data from the day before, but these animals weren't down to their um, basal temp at, uh, this is at 12 noon. These cows that had better cooling on them from the day before had gotten down to their basal temp overnight. These cows did not. And so that thermal loading each day, if we're not getting those animals back down to their basal temperature, they've got to carry that into the next day. And so that's even more that they have to get rid of. So that's why, um, you know, this, it's hugely important that we get those cows down every night so that they can get cooled off before they start the next day. Uh, as you can see, the, the air was changing on me as I, as I went through. And, um, and so you can see this, this loading again, but it's less of a peak than it was the day before. So this was cooling off, but when these two pins, when I switched the cows from one to the other, the cooler cows went warmer and the warmer cows went cooler. And so that's that indication that more airspeed on cows, um, you know, does have a good effect on these animals. And we can get more into the details if somebody wanted to discuss that further on what the trial was. But this is another one of these indications of, uh, of uh, where we, we need to get those animals back down to their basal temp each day if we can. This was a study that was done. It looked at, at bare ground temperature out in full sun and then putting shade on it for five minutes 15 and 30 so if you look at the different times and look at the columns oops sorry i gotta back up <laughs> clicked one too far um if you look at these columns these are at different times of the day as the day was warming up how this temperature with five minutes of shade 15 and 30 made this effect of what that ground temperature was and then below uh, is the air temperature that was in that facility during that time. So again, you can see how shade is hugely important and in you know, stopping that solar gain that's going to the dirt and even has this effect of, of the air temperature inside the facility. So again, getting hotter as we go to each column here with time getting you know, quite hot. But again, as we look down here that, that we're still significantly below an air temperature you know, just by getting shade for, for 30 minutes, we're almost down here to the air temperature. And it's hard to improve on that unless you're doing some sort of uh, soaking or high pressure fog, to either cool the air over the cows or to evaporate that, that air off the animals. So I thought this was kind of a neat demonstration of just how much, you know, solar gain on just dirt. Now, granted, the cow has ways of compensating for that uh, by her um, either seeking shade or her panting, you know, those type of things, standing up so the breeze will go over. But it's just uh, to demonstrate that idea of just how powerful that solar gain is. So this is a picture that uh, was shared with me of uh, kind of a setup here for uh, uh, fairly common, I understand, with the parlor, with the uh, circular tub here, and the things that, it, that just strike as missing that we don't have any shade over these animals. They have shade once they go into the parlor themselves. Uh, generally have some way to put some water on these cows along with fans to create ventilation. So the, the three big pieces that are missing here when we congregate these cows so tightly together uh, has a huge impact on just the short time they're there of actually driving their temperature up from whatever it was when they came from the pasture out here is going to drive up even higher for the period of time if it's one even to two hours that they're standing there. And I'll show you some data related to that. So this is a, a design, of, I think uh, Henry um, you know, shared this or, or Dean here, but this barn is set up. So there's some fans pushing some fresh air into this uh, parlor area. There's fans here to distribute some of this airspeed around the cows on the deck. And then we have a single fan here right at the opening 
out into the, the collecting yard. So there's several opportunities here to put some sort of fans either around the edge or and, and, and somehow get shade over these facilities uh, to uh, stop that solar gain because that's, it's just hugely important. Now, I've had probes in cows and they were actually under a shade or a roof but without airspeed over them, I'd had cows that, that easily went up to, uh, oh, probably, uh, probably around 40, 42 or more, just for a short period of time that they were set in a place where there wasn't any air flow. It has a huge impact on these cows' core body temp. If you remember back to that uh, hair dryer running, uh, you know, 24 seven is basically what you got from these cows that we have to get that heat dissipated. So this is, um, a uh, looking at the heat versus the barn. Now this isn't you know looking at pasture, but just looking at barn environment versus the holding pen in terms of energy production. We got cows that are milking 55 or 20 kilos a day. And so uh, if we look at the heat per cow per day here, they're about um, you know two times higher in terms of milk or heat production just because of that extra milk that a, a cow is a huge uh, metabolic athlete and uh, for the amount of solids, you know, compared to a steer in a feedlot, they'll put out, you know, maybe a, a, a couple kilos um, per day gain. You know, we're talking an animal that's probably putting out uh, close to, you know, five plus to six kilos uh, of dry matter every day. So they're huge metabolic athletes. So again, comparison here about double in terms of the, uh, the uh, heat per hour, depending on the size of the or milk production that we're at. So if we go to the next one, we're looking at the kilos per hour per square foot or square meter of barn floor versus the square meter available in a in a holding pen and waiting yard. So again, this is uh, six and a half times more heat being produced in that environment where these cows are now tightly packed together. There's a whole lot more BTUs that are happening uh, in that uh, square or cubic meter that we're square meter that we're talking about. And if we go to the next year, looking at the effective skin, when those cows are packed together, we don't have the availability of skin to dissipate heat. And so that's why it's hugely important that we're driving air down into these cows, as well as soaking them along with that airflow to get that heat dissipated off these animals when they're in this real high risk environment. And I remember when we talked earlier about that uh, effect on the embryos, that um, We've had anecdotal from uh, uh, a veterinary friend of mine that uh, works with Elanco out in uh, like Idaho, Idaho and California, that they've seen improvements in conception rates by just changing cooling those cows in the holding pen it has a huge impact that even that short time they're exposed two to three times a day in this more concentrated uh, heat production environment because they can't dissipate it has a huge impact on those early embryos, even for that maybe. Uh, even a half hour to an hour that they're exposed. And from what I understand, there's even longer waiting times in uh, some of these environments uh, with the pasture uh, barn setup. And again, we're um, back to the, you know, the feed intake was about half. So this is a, some uh, skin temperature. So this is a threshold that uh, we wanna be below on skin temperature is uh, 34.4. This one here is reading 34.8. Um, and this one is at 35. So these, these animals are above the, uh, the threshold that, that, that they're into heat stress. And this is something that I know, uh, Dean, and if you have other consultants that work with you that, you know, getting either rear udder or even direct skin temperatures, this is a, a, just a, a, an infrared gun that I use. It's fairly inexpensive. You can use it for checking your brakes. Uh, but this is something that uh, Mike Brook at Kansas State, it's, you can stand there on a rotary parlor and just shoot the, the back side of these udders as they're going by you. And uh, this is a dairy that had jerseys in a, in a dry lot. And they were really uh, doing a good job with, uh, with cooling these cows. So they were below that threshold. But again, this is a very simple and expensive tool. If you can't uh, get a hold of this or have somebody consultant that can show you that, but this is something you can do on your own dairy, whether they're in a parallel or a herringbone or a, uh, a rotary parlor that you can easily shoot this is another step up from even doing respiratory rates. So again, this is, uh, I believe this is Collins barn as I was uh, informed. And so again, he's got uh, airflow over these animals. It looks like there's a line over here that uh, 
looks for you know soaking these animals and we have air in here over the cows when they're actually in the uh, the parlor the one thing that i find interesting that i would like to see is with this especially with as low a ceiling as this is in here that that would be insulated to help that the conductivity coming through the roof um that uh you know there's uh, probably probably two and a half to three degrees celsius that will come through this roof into this barn environment without insulation on it and that's a study that was done out of uh with uh, mater out of nebraska looking at the effects of insulation both here in the collecting yard as well as in the parlor here's a solution for soaking cows while they're in on the deck and again these can be adapted to you know even uh, parallels or herringbone but the idea that, I mean, it's very low tech uh, way of setting this up. This is just a streamer type situation. This is a more commercial setup that, that shoots these cows when they're on the, on the deck directly as they're rotating by. This is just using a, a nozzle under pressure with just a, a, a ball valve to control the, the pressure that's coming through it. The key is that you need to soak them ahead of the, the hooks here so that water is over the loin up to the withers. And if you're feeding on the rotary, or whatever system to make sure it's not dripping in your feed there so that you can dial that in to get that to target over the backs of those cows so they can get shot shortly after they get on the, the parlor and again uh, to try to catch them again as they're, they're leaving the parlor either getting off the deck or uh, uh, on the return lane somewhere that you, you soak them again before they head out the pasture so again uh, this is that data that i was telling about the with insulation you're talking about three degrees uh, the other option is to do something with 80% uh, effective shade cloth to cut down that solar gain, uh, maybe from the side of the barn that in the afternoon that you may be getting a little more uh, sun shining in there on these animals once you get shade on top of them. So there's different options there. Again, we got to get the soaking and we got to soak them to the skin. They got it, not just a mist. It's got to be something that will uh, soak that animal down to the bare skin so they can evaporate that heat. And again, we want to create that high velocity air. We want to get that two meter per second plus, if we can, over those animals, especially in that collecting yard. Uh, sorry. Where'd we go here? And again, water, 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 and more water. So again, make sure in that 910 lineal per animal, that, so they have access and, uh, and it's the cheapest ingredient that you can put into, uh, that comes in milk. And so we need to provide that as amply as, and efficiently and, and economically as we can to make sure those cows have plenty of opportunities to drink. And again, this don't forget your dry cows and your pre-fresh heifers. Again, we spoke earlier about the huge impact on both the, the dam's lactation as subsequent uh, um, the, uh, the heifers from that uh, animal during that heat stress. And there's some things you can do with dietary supplements, you know, to, to eat, aid with heat stress, you know, your trace minerals, the, the, you know, the zinc, the seleniums, you know, those type of things. And even niacin has been used as a way of dilating the, uh, the, uh, the vet blood vessels of the skin to help enhance um, um, heat loss, you know, through uh, evaporative cooling. So again, these are those uh, downsides of, of stressed animals. You know, one of them is, you know, increased lameness, we got, uh, you know, cows that, that may come down with pneumonia, got less milk in the tank, and we got, if I get my thing to work here, which it isn't going to, but culls, and, and that's either you're bringing in more animals to replace what you lost, or you're shipping them out because they failed, is, uh, is something that we, we try to avoid, and it's all part of that, that economics of heat loss. There, it finally showed up. Um, so those heat stress effects, again, we hyperactivate the immune system and that just sucks glucose that should be going toward uh, milk production. It has this huge impact here on, on, on the milk production. We got the reproductive efficiency drops dramatically. We're more aptly to have lameness because again, part of that is if we're losing a weight, part of that digital pad is going and that can compound that. And with other things, especially in, in the freestall barns, uh, there's studies looking at elevated cell counts that through the summer that people will say, well, my cell count goes up, but it's not necessarily due to a pathogen. It's because that immune system has been activated and it's just showing up in the milk as an elevated cell count. Where did you go over here? There we go. And we talked here earlier about the, the weight loss and the increased calls. So the three action points that I want you to take home from this whole presentation is shade, soaking, and airflow. If you can target those three things into your strategy, you'll have a huge impact 
on the success of your uh, cooling strategy, regardless of what your uh, your uh, husbandry system system is. So again, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully, I've left time here for some more discussion. But uh, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Mike, and uh, for questions or comments. So I'm going to stop share and uh, take her from there, Mike. Terrific, Doc. Wonderful, wonderful information just in regards to, uh, I guess, the physiology of the animal and what's actually happening. Now, we've got, um, we've got obviously, Colin Thompson back online. And I might, Colin, that was uh, a few shots from your dairy, but you, I guess you've been through some of this process about, uh, about cooling cows. Could you give us a, a bit of a summary, I guess, on, on your journey and, and, your, and some of the learnings along the way? Is that too much to ask as the first question? <laughs> great thanks mike and um yeah Lou, i agree that was a, a great presentation from doctor again and it's good to be reminded of of all those things you tend to just see the the energy cost that comes in every month and uh, and not realize what the actual uh, the fans are doing for your cows and for your production um so so mike just uh, i guess a little um this brief summary of our journey and um we be, we began daring on this property in 2001 and initially we just built a <coughs> A, uh, a covered feed pad and we had loafing paddocks outside. So um, while there was some shade and some cooling, it, uh, it certainly wasn't um, doing the job. In 2011, we began to add free stalls. So we added free stalls uh, to the free stall to the feed pad uh, for the all the milking cows and the transition cows. Again, we saw some improvement from that, um, certainly. And, um, but still I, I had this question mark and uh, and probably the reason I didn't answer Mike's call for two and a half years was because I knew that I had to put fans in there and um, and I, I was just <laughs> delaying that expenditure, I guess. And, um, and and the other thing is I was trying to ask people like Dr. Wolf and, and Chad Mullins and Jim Baymore, so what is, what is the return on my investment going to be? How much extra milk are we going to get from this expenditure? And, you know, I never got a straight answer. No one would actually nail it for me and put a figure on it. Um, instead, what I've got is a presentation like we've just heard of a whole list of things that are going to improve and get better. And, and to me, I kind of, I guess I came to understand that, that if I wanted to have a healthy, high producing herd, then fans were just a standard equipment uh, for our barn. So um, in 2017, we installed fans uh, right through the barn, 40 odd fans, and we already had feed line soakers. Uh, we also installed fans in the holding parlour and and, um, and 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 soakers in there as well. Um, <clears throat> so we saw a a significant increase in um, in production. Um, we've seen a, a an increase in repro performance. Um, but I suppose the thing that you know that we really have noticed is um, it's it just just an improvement in cow comfort. Um, when we build a, a put cows in a barn, I suppose we're really trying to um, emulate all the good things that about a pasture system, but eliminate the disadvantages of a pasture system. And and so we want um, we want fresh fresh feed, we want fresh bedding, we want fresh water, and we want fresh air. And, and that's where the fans have made a big difference to us. Is not just cooling, but it's, it's the fresh air, the air exchange that we're seeing the benefits from. And there's obviously lots of little bugs floating in around in the air and um, and if they're not moved out and, and fresh air brought in, then I think we, before the fans, we were seeing significant respiratory, respiratory um, issues within the cows and, and often treating cows for respiratory problems. And um, that's all but been eliminated with the fans and, and the air exchange. So, um, but in terms of milk production, I guess all those little things have, have added up. And in 2011, when we first built the um, free stalls, uh, we were, the herd was producing around 3.3 million litres uh, annually. Um, today, or la the last financial year, that has grown. We've, we've, we have increased the herd by um, 20 cows, but uh, that has grown to 5 million litres um, annually. So an increase of around 50% or around 5% per year. Additionally to the fans, um, in, uh, in 2017, we all... We also extended our freestall barn to include the dry cows and pregnant heifers, um, and we've seen uh, real benefits from that. In fact, um, if if people say to me they're going to build a freestall barn, I, I suggest that they build the dry cow barn first, um, not last, like we did, and uh, and really get some 
benefits from uh, repro and, and carvings and, and all that sort of thing. In uh, June 2020, uh, we also have built a heifer freestall barn and, and, um, and just recently we've completed a, a calf barn. So now every animal on our farm is, is in a shed or barn somewhere. So I guess that's our uh, summary of our journey, Mike. Um, certainly we've seen some significant benefits on the investment that we've made. Uh, terrific, Colin. That's a fantastic story, and it's wonderful to hear someone in the industry that's happy to share their successes um, and and just those really practical things. I'm going to throw it over to Charlie uh, just just quickly. Um, Charlie, we talked about some of the um, uh, I guess some of the stresses with on those animals, and I guess in your part of the world, and just some of the struggles that you're seeing on farm and and some of those, those stress points in the animals when they're starting and, and, when, and when they're starting to ease. Yeah, we, um, coming out of California, I spent 10 years in California in vet practice before managing the dairy. And that's obviously uh, a different level of heat stress than we see in the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, but we still get a, uh, a, a significant impact. And I know Dairy NZ has been putting some resources up on the, um, on the web around the, the impact of heat stress in different areas throughout New Zealand. And you're talking about two to uh, anywhere from one and a half down in Southland up to seven or eight kilos of milk solids per cow uh, lost uh, because of the, um, of the heat stress that we're seeing down here. And they even, uh, rather than being as complicated as what uh, Dr. Wolf was pointing out, they just say for 10 seconds, if you get 10 breaths, uh, to start to indicate some of that heat stress. But um, me personally, having stood up on the platform, doing the, uh, the, the, the scanning of the cows and, and actually doing some of the insemination as well, you start to build up the heat in these cows and you can actually feel the difference during the day as, as that first cow that comes on the platform versus the last cow that comes on the platform. And, and by the end of an, an, an afternoon, uh, you'll have a buildup of sweat in the in the palpation sleeve to where you could you, you know that you've lost a couple of liters of water inside these gloves while you're doing the scanning in, um, in palpation and you just imagine what that's doing to that embryo inside and some of the some of the impact on on the um, conception rates because um, I think uh, Dr. Wolf pointed it out was the 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 extent of that even that one to two hours of, um, of heat shock that you that these cows get subjected to when you when you have the the 30 plus degree day and the impact of what up to 10 to 12 percent um, conception rates that you can lose and that's that's the sort of thing that uh, we see mostly in New Zealand um, I've, I've always thought of um, from the New Zealand vet perspective uh, milk production is just a, a byproduct of good reproduction so if we can focus on keeping the cows cool and get them bred, then we're going to, we're going to end up with the milk one way or the other. Absolutely. And I guess that's the, um, Colin, you sort of touched on it just in regards to your, your, your dry stock and, um, and that shock where, I guess, where did those learnings come from? What was the push um, to put virtually shelter over those animals to start off with? Where did that start? Yeah, certainly. My, I guess uh, it was the information that I was receiving um, from people like Dr. Wolf and and, um, and Jeff Jeff Dale uh, also visited the property. Um, but yeah, it was certainly I can see uh, putting a cow out in the summer, like out, out of the freestall barn, and we we're drawing off, and, and they were going out into a loafing paddock, and and, and you know the, you could see them come back and stand along the side of the barn. That they, were that, uh, they just wanted to be back in there, and and so I guess that was a a pretty clear indication, but I wasn't fully aware of the the real benefits of cooling dry cows until I actually did it and and um, and, and can see it now. And we've got a lot of pasture based um, farmers online at the moment and looking to cool cool cows. Um, Doc Wolf talked about shade soaking and air velocity or, or ventilation. Colin, what, what's what's the what's the first What's the first step in, in, in your your opinion? Where do we where, where do you start? I certainly I believe that the um, pasture based systems have a real opportunity to cool cows in the parlour or in the holding yard, and and they should maximise that. I mean, it, it's a it's really not a big investment to 
provide as much cooling as possible in that holding yard. And I think the second thing that they they often pasture farms they're not a lot of haven't got the message about water. And I think that's a second uh, area I would start is uh, providing more water space um, on some of those pasture based farms. And that that's an, another cheap alternative to um, provide additional cooling. Sure. And Darla, you made. I definitely second that. Yeah, jump on. You, you, yeah, made, I've, you, I've, you made a very good point about reproductions. Just uh, uh, what, what was it? What was it again? Sorry. Yeah, just the the impact of getting them. You, every cow on the on the farm is going to go through these one spot every twice a day. So if you've got that opportunity to cool that cow at that point. And there's not a huge data set out there, but um, as we can build it, as we, and as we start looking at it more and more, uh, trying to get some, so these cows cooled and how long is that cooling gonna be residual? But I know that um, some of the embryo work that's been done, it takes less than a half hour of a, of a heat shock to, uh, to damage that embryo significantly to where it's not going to have the same same viability as a uh, as a non heat shock embryo. Mm. And when's the biggest stress points for you then? When in what time of year we're talking? Uh, essentially, from right now onward, uh, there will be during the uh, the mating season in the South Island. Here we had a few different days that were above thirty, but we don't typically see the the thirty five degree days. But uh, right now, today, this afternoon. Um, even is going to be um, in the upper 20s and just walking around uh, some farm this morning actually the similar to the ones in my background they were uh, they were lying there panting pretty good um, trying to find the shade and con uh, congregate it all together trying to uh, lie in the one little spot that had some shade that was actually a little bit moist so we'll see what somatic cell count does in the next couple of days as well mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, and I don't know if I've got any other questions from the group, but I've, I've got um, Peter Farengruber here, who I had out uh, in the Southern Hemisphere back in 2007. I'm throwing you under the bus here, Peter. Um, but I guess you've seen this huge progression in what you've seen in the States and in Europe around the world, and you're seeing what's happening in Australia and New Zealand at the moment um, of us trying to, I guess, looking at these more uh, intense systems and trying to cool cows and looking at effluent control and obviously your business is in um, uh, environmental impacts, oh, sorry, uh, creating animal centred environments. Um, and I guess from what you've seen in the States in the last sort of 20 years in your involvement and where we are now, what's, uh, I guess, what are you suggesting or what are you, what are you seeing? Where's our big wins in, uh, where, where's our low picking fruit? Well, I think the low ticking fruit would be taking care of these milking centers because every cow is going to be impacted with it. And, uh, and I think, it, as Colin was saying, it's basically an area where you're going to have a, a minimal amount of an investment to have an incredible impact. And one of the beauties that you have both in New Zealand and Australia is you have cooler nights. So if we can take care of the cows during the day so that we can get their temperature at a, at a relatively good part point, remember that her temperature is going to be building, building, building until maybe two o'clock in the morning. And then it's going to peak out and then it's going to start dropping. So the goal is to get that temperature peaking sooner so that when the morning comes, she's back to a nice neutral level where she can start the day again and win the war. And so it's critical that really take a look at your milking centers, making sure you do an incredible job providing fresh air into them, creating velocity and adding water. Um, and if you have cases where the cows are going to be standing there for a long period of time, that we have water troughs, there's some kind of access to drink water too. So we can't get, let that disappear. And from there, start looking at, you start moving down the line and what's your next priorities. And uh, is it going to be the dry cows would be the next section that you want to take care of. And then your milking cows and, and create a strategy where you're controlling as much under roof as you can, even though you may want to go outside. So you even control your feed. So we're not spoiling it or wasting it. And it'll pay off. I think uh, farmers who have had the opportunity to do so sees the benefits quicker than the ones that don't. And we all need to look at data on what makes difference, understanding what's creating the challenges on your farm. When do your cows actually suffer? 
how much are the, what's the first thing that goes is repro. So we know that's the critical thing that we need to resolve. So I think there's many things that we can look at, but first step, take care of your parlor and milking center. Wonderful. I guess the exciting thing about this is, it's, I guess it's the start of a conversation. We've reached our, our 1030 mark, but um, what we're doing some work with uh, in Charlie's part of the world with some cooling cows and in and around the parlour. And obviously uh, Colin's got his uh, set up where he is and it's, it's, it's bringing that brain's trust of people in that have, uh, that have done this type of work and, and are cooling cows for a living. Um, which is which is makes my job a really enjoyable enjoyable job when you get to work with people like this and you see the success of someone like Colin Thompson who was asking those questions what three years ago and saying what will it give what will it do for me what will it do for me and exactly the presentation that Doc just gave so it's great to get some numbers behind it I think over the over the next um, in the next several future we've got smart technology that is, is monitoring these cows now and being able to watch actually what's happening within the animal um, and, and referring these, putting these, putting all this information together. So we've got some really hard facts. We always look at reproduction and production as an indicator, but it's great to see when we bring these animals into a holding yard, you know, how long, how long we've got to cool them and how much we bring the uh, core body temperature down. So some really exciting stuff happening in this space. Thanks very much for to all our panelists, thanks, Colin Thompson, for your um, for your input. I think it's great to uh, see that story and uh, progressing. Um, and thanks, Doc Wolf, for your presentation on the physiology of the animal. And thanks, Dr. Charlie Chase, for um, joining us. And uh, and Peter Farengruber from PSR Techs and Henry Collins, also who's on, and Dean Fry from Eagle Direct. So yeah, wonderful to have you all on. Merry Christmas to everyone. I uh, hope you have a great, uh, safe break, and we look forward to catching up with you in 2022. All There's the one question from Mark Towner. Okay, far away. Uh, I see he brought, yeah, asking about what direction did you want to have the, um, the wind blowing? Is it across the face or from the bum? Oh, good call. I guess oh, I should I'll take, take this one. Oh, you're going to take that one, Colin? Okay, go ahead. Um, well, it's, it's, well, it's cause he's asking, I've just seen the question here cause he's asking about a rotary parlor, um, whether to blow from the front or from behind. Um, again, it, it's, it's more in that sense, it's more the design of the facility. You'd never, you don't ever want to be blowing air from a holding yard into, a, into, into the parlor area itself. Cause all then you're doing is transferring heat that comes off your cows in your holding yard and you're just pushing all that heat and all, if you've got soaking or water in your holding yard, you're pushing all that humidity then also into your parlour and typically holding yards are open. So, and, and parlours most of the time are closed on three or four sides, uh, oh, sorry, two or three of the sides. So if, you, if you're just pushing all that heat and, and water in there without anywhere for it to escape, um, you're just going to, you're just going to pump all the humidity and temperature up within that facility. Um, so what we're looking to do in a parlor is typically if you're, if you're closed on three sides, we're pushing fresh air in. Um, sometimes we're putting high pressure fogging on that too to cool air as it comes into that rotary parlor. So you actually drop ambient temperature in. And then we're looking at bl blowing air across, your, across your, your parlor and then out through the holding yard. So you keep your air in your parlor fresh and then you're moving air down along your cows in your holding yard, but you're pushing it out into, uh, into, the, into the open, basically. So we're looking to go front on in that, in that situation. There you go, perfect. Answer this question. Yeah, uh, Ed, I guess anyone else have a question? Excellent. Excellent answer. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for joining us. So we will send you, what we'll do is we'll send you all out of, um, a video of the pre uh, presentation and Doc's presentation, and uh, we'll have all our details on it as well. So, uh, yeah, reach out uh, if you've got any questions after, and uh, we'll try to get them answered. Thanks, everyone. They're all all goodbye. See you later. disappearing and we can press stop record.